Utilizing an array of biblical, rabbinic, liturgical, historical, and modern texts, I have attempted to outline the main features of oral transmission and memorization in the history of Judaism and Christianity. To understand the emphasis on memorization in Judaism and Christianity, I also investigated the surrounding cultures of Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, and Greece to discern if their emphasis on memorization could have influenced the Jews and Christians. During our investigation into memorization in Judaism in the Middle East, time will be spent exploring its importance in the Biblical period, let's say 2000 BC to 70 AD, and within that broad stroke subdivisions include the First Temple period, 970 to 586 BC, and the Second Temple period, 536 BC to 70 AD. The next period is the Rabbinic period, let's call it 1st to 6th centuries, with subdivisions into the Tanaitic, we'll call that 70 AD to 200 AD, and Amoraic periods, we'll call that 200 to 500 AD. The next period will be the Medieval period, 5th to 16th century, with the subdivision including the Genoic period, 7th to 11th centuries, and finally the modern period, 17th to the 21st century. During our investigation into memorization and Christianity in the Middle East, time will be spent exploring its importance in the early church, let's call it 1st to 3rd century, the Byzantine period, 324 to 638, the medieval period, 5th to 16th centuries, and the modern period, 17th to the 21st century. The subject of this book is so vast, stretching over millennia, that we can offer only an encapsulation of the primary aspects of memorization in daily life. As the select bibliography indicates, each topic is a book in itself. Consequently, the research involved is more time consuming than writing. The research for the book took seven months. The project took much longer than anticipated, but upon finishing I realized I had really just begun. The footnotes and quotes attest to my dependence on the expertise of respected authors and living persons within Judaism and Christianity in the old city of Jerusalem. Aiming the book at both the specialists and non-specialists, I hope that in the process I haven't missed either. In this book, I turn not to strangers, but to those followers of the Holy Bible, whose hearts belong to it and who wish to know it more profoundly. I know that fewer people are won over by the written word than by the spoken word, and that every great movement on this earth owes its growth more to great speakers than to great writers. Nevertheless, in order to produce more uniformity in the defense of this vital spiritual exercise, its fundamental principles were committed to writing. Chapter 1. In this chapter, we want to start with the background of when the world was oral and dominated by memorization and orality before we narrow our emphasis on Judaism and Christianity. We want first to step back and trace the importance of the oral story, the spoken word, and the exercise of memorization in cultures within the sphere of influence of Judaism to determine, as well as speculate, how these cultures' emphasis on orality may have affected Judaism's emphasis on memorization. General Description Long before any story had been transmitted to writing, there existed only oral literature delivered from memory and transmitted orally from person to person. Without the story, we do not have human identity. There are stories surviving from every human era and almost every social group known to us, if not frozen in writing, then frozen in burial tomb portrayals. This is because we identify humanity and others by hearing their stories. Today, a text read well, but especially recited from memory, regains some of its original oral authority and impact. God did not write to Moses, but spoke to him.
The sense of the spoken word as divine power is especially vivid in the foundational accounts of diverse peoples, ancient and modern in all parts of the world. Accounts of the origin of the world ascribe the initial creative act to the spoken divine word not only in the opening of Genesis and John, but also the creative work of Ptah in ancient Egyptian mythology. The traditions of an oral society had the advantage of an undeniable intimacy and directness with the divine word which are somewhat lost when the stories are written down. Putting words down permanently in writing places them outside the heart, while the seat of emotion lies inside the heart. A literate culture can indeed have a rich and imaginative religious literature, but its dependence on the written word alone inevitably creates distance between the community and its faith and practice. The greater part of ancient literature was intended for the ears more than the eyes. Yet, the replacement of oral transmission by use of the written word has been the repeated uniform pattern of historical development across all geographical and cultural boundaries, even though the variation of how long or late this occurs is quite large. To understand this very special aspect of oral transmission and memorization, we must momentarily forget our technological civilization and its way of life. For us, setting thought down in a permanent and material form so that it can be found again in an unaltered state are acts that seem so natural to us that we can scarcely imagine societies that were able to do without them almost entirely. Thought was handed down in the most lasting and permanent nature, in the same way Yahweh created the world, by the spoken word. The emphasis on memorization was an anthropological phenomenon among cultures that influenced Jewish thought and practice. The mind or heart stood at the center of the oral written crossing point in the regions within the sphere of influences. The focus on these surrounding cultures was on inscribing their most precious traditions on the insides of their people. Within this context, copies of text served as solidified reference points for recitation and memorization of their respective traditions. Like today, such tasks of vast memorization were not for the unskilled. Like today, few of the literates would have progressed to the point where they were, have been able or motivated enough to memorize such vast texts verbatim. There are many parallels in the cultures of Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, and Greece in regards to the fundamental emphasis on memorization. Small-scale kingdoms like Israel and Judah maintain educational and scribal systems that often emulated their neighbors and borrowed their mnemonic techniques while working in a larger sphere of oral tradition. Let us examine the above-mentioned cultures and see if their emphasis on memorization could have influenced or have been borrowed by the Jewish people. Memorization in Ancient Egypt In the intermixed oral written environment of the New Kingdom in Ancient Egypt, our textual evidence regarding their educational process is meager. We have some ostraca and reused paper, almost exclusively from the 16th to 11th century BC, New Kingdom, found at Deir el Medina. We lack widespread examples of upper level educational texts, many of which were written on perishable wooden boards and paper. The earliest and most prominent forms of education appear to have involved the temple and family-based learning like we later observe in ancient Israel. We do know that Egyptian education stressed copying, memorization, and recitation of their core curriculum, 
The goal of memorization is reflected in various ways in the Egyptian texts. The instruction of Ptahotep concludes with an injunction to listen to the written word, including a promise that this memory will preserve the oral tradition. Memory of the teachings maxims will not depart from the mouths of man because of their perfection of their verses. One key mnemonic used in the Egyptian memorization process was training students to sing or chant texts, like we observe later in Judaism during the time of Isaiah in chapter 28. Most of the core texts appear to have been composed for oral performance with the use of metrical and repetitive structures to facilitate the memory. Many exercises include the first line of the following section so that the students memorizing individual texts can put them in the correct order. Like in later Judaism, the goal of Egyptian scribal students was memorize mastery of the cultural tradition. In the New Kingdom text, Instruction of Ani, Ani calls on his son to memorize written wisdom to study the writings, put them on your heart. Yet the writing concludes with a debate between him and his son in which his son points out that learning based on writings is incomplete for those who do not understand them, for a son thinks poorly in himself when he merely recites sayings from books. He goes on to make a contrast between truly internalized teachings and those that are merely mouthed from memory. When your words are pleasing in the heart, the heart inclines to receive them. Then the heart rejoices in the abundance of your virtues, and thoughts are lifted up to you. A boy cannot perform the moral teachings when the books are merely on his tongue. The notion of memorizing a text solely as religiously edifying but not knowing its contents is a phenomenon we will see later practice in rabbinic Judaism. Egyptian sacred texts were memorized with a copy deposited in the temple or the house of life for safekeeping like we see later in the Jewish temple. There was also an emphasis on hearing and inscribing teachings on the heart with a focus on memorization. What little we do know about education during the New Kingdom places a tremendous emphasis on memorization and the orality of text. It is tempting to infer what influenced the New Kingdom of Egypt's education system and their emphasis on memorization had on the Israelites who lived there for 430 years. Did the Jews borrow the model of homeschool education from the Egyptians? Did the emphasis on memorization Moses received in Egyptian schools prepare him to be able to gather, memorize, and retain all the sources he needed to compose the Torah from memory? Did Moses pass these mnemonic techniques of oral transmission and memorization down to certain individuals or clans among the children of Israel? Memorization in ancient Assyria and Babylonia like Egypt, the students of Assyria and Babylonia often learn through a process of dictation, memorization, and recitation. The teacher tells the student in one Assyrian dialogue, Repeat it to me. Say everything to me exactly. Another dialogue has the student say, I explained my exercise tablets to my father, recited my tablet to him, and he was delighted. Ultimately, the goal was for the successful Assyrian or Babylonian student to become a scribe and be able to both write down and accurately recite the lists and standard stories that were the foundation of their education and culture. This included memorization of extensive lists nameless, treaties, hymns, epics, and so on. A student in one dialogue boasts that he can give the 600 signs in their correct order, and another, my teacher had to show me a sign only once and I could add several from memory. The emphasis on memorization was not just for the students. The Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, in the 7th century, 
asked a blessing from his god, Shamash, on anyone who memorizes his hymn and can perform it. We read in the benediction, Whosoever shall learn this text by heart and glorify the god of the judges, Shamash, may he make his enemies precarious. May the word of his mouth please the people. From Tablet 7 of Anuma Elish, which describes the 50 names of the Babylonian god Marduk, we read, The sage and the learned shall together ponder them. Father shall tell of them to son and recite them to him. The total may well have run into tens of thousands of lines for some students to memorize. These ancient cultures were enthusiastic about writing, but we have texts that still stress the importance attached to learning by heart. From the era myth, we find, The scribe who learns this text by heart escapes the enemy, is honored in his own land. In the congregation of the learned, where my name is constantly spoken, I will open his ears. These ancient scribes had memorized their traditions and could use those earlier memorized texts as mental prototypes, reusing them, recombining them, and later adapting them in the process of creating new texts. Though they were capable of reading and copying an ancient tablet, they did not necessarily need to. The primary mode of existence of such ancient texts was not written tablets, but the tablet of the heart of the well-trained scribes. Like Egypt, it is tempting to infer what influence the Babylonian education system and emphasis on memorization had on those who were deported, those who were carried away into exile. Because we read in Daniel 1.4, teach them the learning of the Babylonians. Memorization in Ancient Greece Memorization and her virtues were well acknowledged by Greek mythology. Nemosne, the goddess of memorization, had borne Zeus nine daughters, the Muses, who personified and presided over different modes of the arts and sciences. This myth of Nemosne and her muses articulates the centrality of memory in Greek culture. As mother of the muses, Nemosne was the origin of all artistic and scientific labors and the wellspring of civilization. From the perspective of that myth, it was not writing, nor logic, or rhetoric that was perceived to be the central agency, but memorization. We have little epigraphic evidence from ancient Greece that helps us to know what kind of techniques the Greeks used to memorize and what stress was laid on memorization. Much of what we know about 3rd and 4th century BC Greek education comes from the writings of Plato. In Protagoras and Laws, Plato has Protagoras describe early education as follows. When boys have learned their letters and are ready to read and understand the written word as formerly the spoken, they set the works of great poets next to them to read and make them learn them by heart. Among the Greek students' goals was to have texts written on the tablet of their heart. Toward this end, teachers and authors provided memory hubs for their students. For example, in Aristotle's work on memory, we see the recommendation that students link items in a series to letters in the alphabet using the alphabet sequence learned early in education as a structure on which to hang more complex memorized texts gained later on. In Homer, there are numerous elements that would have aided memorization. Use of standard sequences, repetition of the same sequence, repetition of broader speeches, and so on. It is well known the influence that Hellenism had on Jewish culture. It is written from the first century in rabbinic sources that 
permission was given to the house of Rabban Gamaliel to teach their children Greek, owing to their relation to the Roman government. Again from the first century, there were a thousand young men in my father's house, five hundred of whom studied the Torah, while the other five hundred studied Greek wisdom. In the Talmud, it records that in the Hellenized town of Caesarea, there were Jews who read the Shema in Greek. The rabbis spoke to the people in Aramaic, but in the midst of their homilies, they often inserted Greek words. The Greek language and educational methods took hold of all classes among all nations on the Mediterranean seaboard. The Jewish world was no exception in this respect. Almost everything Greek penetrated deep into all the classes of Jewish society. The emphasis placed on memorization and its mnemonic techniques in Greek education would have undoubtedly been incorporated into the already existing orally dominated Jewish education system. To what extent Greek memorization techniques were adopted by the Jewish people and if there was a revival of memorization due to Greek influence? We do not know. Chapter 1 Conclusion The civilizations which influenced many of the writers and cultures of the Bible were assertive about the necessity of memorization, as we have clearly seen from their own primary sources. In the above-mentioned cultures, memorization and the student's heart were the key focus in teaching texts, as we see later in Judaism. Memorizable texts carried many formulae, stanzas, expressions, and cliches which were valued as memory aids and characteristics that fit ancient oral cultures. Oral communication has always had a tendency to be very conservative and traditionalist. While writing freezes information so that it can be preserved without great effort, orality must rely on memory and repetition to preserve valuable information and therefore gives more weight to true traditional wisdom than to new ideas. Just as the Egyptian satiric letter spoke of the addressee as having the teaching of every book inscribed on his heart, and several Greek texts spoke of having texts written on the tablet of the heart, so also Jewish literature joined textuality and memorization in this way.